Hey, welcome to Heritage. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. My name is Brock Polk, and I, I just want to tell you that it means the world to me that we get the opportunity to share this time and this experience together. So whether you're here in the room or whether you're participating or listening in later online, I, I am so proud of you and proud and thankful for the way that we are devoting time and attention together to connecting more deeply with Jesus. And today is a great opportunity for your next step on your journey with Jesus because we're continuing an important series of messages where we're describing and examining Jesus's vision for the good life. We're listening in on what Jesus has to say about what a human life well lived looks like. You see, there's this passage in the Bible. It's found in Matthew chapters five, six, and seven. And this passage, these three chapters, they are foundational to the Christian journey. We refer to this passage as the Sermon on the Mount because apparently Jesus was teaching to a large crowd of people. So he started climbing the base of a mountain where he could get kind of a high vantage point and everybody could see him and all of that. But when he was making this, delivering this message, when he was sharing this sermon, he was sharing a guidebook, a manual for what the Christian life looks like. And anybody who wants to know what it means to follow Jesus, anybody who's curious about how they could follow Jesus more intently, or somebody who's just trying to investigate what following Jesus is all about would do really well to just focus their attention on Matthew chapters five, six, and seven. In fact, I've said it before in this series, and I'll say it again today that these three chapters, Matthew five through seven, ought to be a passage of scripture that we are particularly acquainted with as followers of Jesus. If, if you've struggled to be a Bible reader, if that has always been something that's been difficult, challenging for you, or if you aren't even sure where to get started in your journey of reading through the scriptures, I would gladly suggest that you just camp out in these three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's a great place for you to start, a great place for you to dwell. Read it more than once. Go over it time and time again because these chapters are casting a vision for what the Christian life really looks like. And the passage, this, this three-chapter passage, begins with a short section where Jesus lists a series of blessings or beatitudes, which is just an ancient word that means the same thing. And this was a common teaching strategy for teachers in that era where they would share their vision. A, a religious teacher would share their description, their understanding, their vision about who in this life is blessed. And by default, they would also be describing who in this life is not blessed. And when the teacher would share their worldview like that, they were sharing their understanding of how things work, how the world operates, how things really happen. And so Jesus was using this common teaching strategy, but the content of his blessing statements was absolutely not common. It was as different as different could be. You see, as Jesus made this list in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, as Jesus made this list of these blessings, he kept announcing blessings for people that nobody expected him to bless. He keeps announcing blessings for people that everybody looks around and has a curious questioning look on their face when they hear it. He spoke blessings about people who were sad. He said, people who are sad, they're blessed. He spoke blessings about people who are weak. He said, weak people, they're blessed. He spoke blessing about people who were passive, about people who didn't have much social capital or clout. He spoke blessing about people who didn't look blessed and who didn't feel blessed. And everybody who heard Jesus say it, they were likely to have looked around with a puzzled expression, thinking to themselves, is that right? Is he talking about us? Is, is he talking about who I think he's talking about? 
And that's the question that you and I still wrestle with when we come to these passages, these blessings. But, but Jesus was not confused. Jesus was visionary. Jesus was bringing a heavenly perspective to an earthly conversation. And he was explaining realities that no human being had ever considered or imagined. He was explaining the way things really are in the cosmic realm, not just in the limited perspective of worldly cultures and human nature. And as Jesus shared these blessings with a twinkle in his eye, he was broadcasting clues about the changes that he came to put in place. You know, I read recently about a bicycle race that's popular in small communities in India. And it's, a, it's an interesting, I've watched some videos of it on YouTube and there's videos of these races going on and the bikes are of all shapes and sizes and none of them look like they're specialized for, you know, racing. But the funny thing about this race format is that the object of the race is to travel the shortest distance possible during the allotted time of the race. And so all the riders line up at the starting line and then the race starts and they all hop on the pedals, but they try to go as slow as they possibly can without falling over. And there's a lot of moving the handlebars back and forth like this, trying to keep your balance. And there's some who for a little while are able to keep the bike still, but if their feet touch the ground, they're disqualified. If they start to fall off the bike and they reach out to balance themselves, then they're out of the race. And so when the, when the time for the race is over, the rider who traveled the furthest is the first loser. And the rider who is closest to the starting line is the winner. And as you watch these races online, you can tell what a great time everybody's having laughing and everybody's so joyful and it's really funny to watch. But you can imagine the confusion if someone entered that race thinking it was a traditional bike race. You can imagine if a professional cyclist with all of their spandex clothes and their you know, heavily engineered bicycle and their aerodynamic helmet got into that race thinking, I think I can take these guys. You can imagine the confusion because they'd be pedaling as hard and as fast as they could and probably feeling really good about the early lead that they jumped out to take, but then they would be disappointed in just a few minutes when the end of the allotted time came and they discovered that they had entirely misunderstood the goal of what the race was all about. Well, I wanna to suggest to you that with the Beatitudes, with these statements of blessing, Jesus is explaining who the winners are going to be when this life reaches its end. And the reason that Jesus' teaching in these statements is so provocative is because the people that Jesus says are going to win, they look like they're losing right now. They're pedaling so slow. They don't look like they're making much progress. Some of them look like they're standing still or even going backwards. And what Jesus is proposing if you wanted to try to win the race that Jesus is explaining here, you would have to completely change your strategy for living your life. It's like being in a bike race, pedaling fast, and then discovering that the entire goal of the race was to pedal slow. And so Jesus is telling us here, Jesus is telling us where God's blessing goes. He's telling us where God's favor rests and it's not with the rich and the powerful and it's not with the strong and the self-sufficient and it's not even with the deeply and ritually religious people. Jesus is announcing God's unexpected blessing for people who are poor, who are underprivileged, who are disappointed and also for the people who care about them. And that brings us to the beatitude that we're gonna look at together today. It's Matthew chapter five, verse eight. It's just one sentence, so short it would be easy for you to, rec to just commit it to memory. So short, you've, you've probably heard and will recognize this before, but here's what Jesus said, Matthew chapter five, verse eight. He said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they will see God. Now, if you're going to appreciate the nuance of what Jesus is trying to say here, you have to think about who Jesus was talking to, where Jesus was. He was speaking in a, in a Jewish context to an almost entirely Jewish audience. And Judaism, as you may know, has some elaborate rules in place about purity. In fact, the Jewish law that was established in the Old Testament includes an entire system and regimen for people to maintain what they would recall, what they would call ritual or ceremonial purity. The system that was given to them defined the boundaries of sacred space. For daily life, for somebody who lived in that Jewish culture, there were parts of life that were sacred. There were places that they sometimes could go that were sacred places, tabernacles and temples. There were places that they could go when they were ceremonially clean so that they could enter those places because God's presence lived among the people in the tabernacle and later in the temple and God's presence demands reverence. And so there were specific situations that could render a person ceremonially unclean for a certain period of time. If you shook hands with somebody who wasn't Jewish, if you touched a dead body of a person or a, an unclean animal, if you developed a rash, if you gave birth, there was a waiting period. Then, then there was a ritual process that had to be followed before you were invited and eligible to return to the tabernacle or the temple to offer sacrifice and to give your worship. But it's so important, and there's a lot of people that misunderstand this part. It is so important to understand that being ceremonially unclean in Judaism was not wrong. It wasn't sinful to be ceremonially unclean. In fact, being ritually unclean was unavoidable in this life. It was a fact of life that occasionally something was going to happen. You were gonna come in contact with something. You were gonna give birth. Something was gonna go on in your life that was gonna leave you ritually unclean for a little while. And while that was inconvenient and mildly disappointing, it wasn't a problem. In fact, it served a purpose by giving people a tangible reminder of the holiness of God and the gravity of being in God's presence. So being ceremonially unclean was not wrong. And it wasn't to be looked down upon. It was just part of their faith. But there was another type of purity that was, that was much more consequential. And that was the matter of moral purity, ethical purity. Purity. You see, at the same time that God outlined the laws and instituted the, the system that would establish those ritual ceremonial purity laws, God also instituted moral laws for God's people. Laws about the way that people ought to engage with one another. Laws about the way that you live together in community. Laws about the way that you treat other people. And these laws placed an incredibly high priority, a high bar on justice for the oppressed. Generosity for people who were underprivileged. Responsibility to care for one another, not just for the people that you know, not just for the people in your household, not just for the people that are from your country. God's law demanded that people place a high emphasis, a high priority on caring for everybody who was vulnerable. And what happened, what happened throughout much of Israelite history is that people paid a lot of attention to those ritual purity laws. They majored in that stuff. They took it really seriously. They were very particular about getting all of those procedures and rituals and ceremonies just right. But they allowed themselves to pay less attention to the moral and the ethical laws, to moral cleanliness. And God all the time was saying, this part's more important. God was constantly coming back and saying, this doesn't matter if this is broken. The ceremonial stuff doesn't make a difference if the moral stuff is totally out of whack. 
In fact, there's an episode a few chapters after this sermon, Matthew chapter 15. And it's about a time when some Jewish leaders, the experts in the law came and confronted Jesus because they had noticed that when Jesus' disciples ate a meal, they didn't do a ceremonial hand washing first. Now this is not about hygiene. It's not about table manners. This is a ritual issue. It's a religious ceremony that they're talking about. And they're not talking about a law that God put in place. They're talking about an additional rule, an additional tradition that the leaders had instituted in order to emphasize devotion and to emphasize particularly their own devotion. And they assumed that any Jewish leader worth their salt, any Jewish leader that was serious about this, would ask their students to follow those ritual hand-washing procedures. We're talking about, you know, holding your hands out like a surgeon and having water poured over them before the meal happened. It's all a big ceremony. But Jesus' take was different. He didn't share the teacher's concern about his disciples' hands at mealtime, what he was concerned about was that these leaders who were questioning him, these leaders who were trying to trap him, these leaders who were trying to discredit him in the public view had a tendency to major in the ritual stuff and ignore the moral and ethical stuff. And so after Jesus started pointing out some of the ways that these leaders were skirting the spirit of the law. To their faces, he called them hypocrites. And he quoted a passage from one of the Old Testament prophets that they would have been very familiar with. He said, Isaiah was right about y'all. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you and said, these people, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They honor me in a way that everybody else can see. They honor me in a way that everybody else can take note of, but the part that's on the inside that nobody knows about, not even close. Isaiah was right about you when he prophesied, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. He says their ritual is worthless. Their teachings are merely human rules. And then he called all the other people around who were listening, all of his disciples, all the people who weren't teachers of the law. And he said, listen and understand what I'm about to tell you. He said, whatever goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. You don't become unclean because of what goes into your mouth. It's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. This is groundbreaking stuff. This is earth-shaking stuff for a bunch of people who spent a lot of energy focused on their ritual cleanliness. They avoided certain tasks, they avoided certain places, they avoided certain people, just trying to keep themselves prepared for the next time that they got to go to the temple to worship. But here's Jesus, clearly, blatantly, and unapologetically giving higher priority to the condition of someone's heart instead of someone's hands. He says, this is more important. And he's calling out these leaders for pretending to honor God while they're really advancing their own position, their own status, their own reputation in the community. In fact, he went on to have further conversation with his disciples, the people who were following him. And, and all of those, he, he said, all of these leaders of the, of the teachers of the law, he said, they're leading their followers down the wrong spiritual path. He said, don't follow somebody who emphasizes and prioritizes ceremonial and ritual cleanliness at the expense of focus on moral and ethical cleanliness. He says you can get all of the spiritual and ritual practices right and you can totally miss the point because your heart's in the wrong place. Here's what Jesus said later in that chapter, Matthew 15, verse 17. He says, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth 
goes into the stomach and then out of the body, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. These things, the, he says, the things you say, those aren't the result of what you ate. Those are the result of what you believe. Those are the result of who you are. Those are, the, those are the result of what you think and what you've decided and what you want and what you feel. He says in the next verse, he says, for out of the heart, out of the heart, make sure don't miss that. He's saying, this is the source. Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, lying or false testimony, slander. These are the things that defile a person. These are the things that really make you unclean, but eating with unwashed hands, that's not the problem. <laughs> he says, that's not what defiles somebody. You see, ceremonial purity, this ritual stuff that they were practicing, it was all well and good as a spiritual training tool to help them treat God's presence with the respect and the reverence and the gravity that it deserves. But Jesus knew that what really matters is not the condition of your hands, but the condition of your heart. What really matters is how you relate to God. About, it's who you are on the inside because it's in our hearts where we connect with the Father. It's in our hearts where God wants to take up residence. It's where God, it's in our hearts where God really desires to live. Now, none of this should have been a surprise to the religious leaders. God's been more interested in purity of heart from the beginning. God revealed time and time again in the stories of the Old Testament and the prophecies of the Old Testament that the heart is what matters. There was a moment when the prophet Samuel was sent to anoint David as Israel's next king, and he found David to be the youngest and the smallest and the least impressive of Jesse's eight sons. But God spoke to Samuel and reminded him, said, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks where? At the heart. Proverbs 3, verse 5, challenges the reader to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not to lean on your own understanding. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 13, the Lord encouraged the exiled Israelites with a hope for the future and said, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Not with ritual, not with ceremony, not with sacrifice, but with your inner being, with your inner self. And so what God has been saying for generation after generation is that the heart of a person, the longings, the motivations, the ambitions, the desires that are inside of us, that's what really counts. Which is why if you go and read the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, like I've talked about, if you go and study Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you're going to find Jesus talking about how to get your heart in line with your behavior. He says, it's not enough to just not commit murder. And that's a good behavior. I mean, you know, not committing murder, that's a good thing. He said, but Jesus says, it's not enough to just not commit murder if your heart is boiling with anger towards somebody. Because if that's the case, Jesus is gonna say, your heart is still polluted. It's not enough to not kill somebody when deep down inside you kind of wish you could. It's not enough, Jesus says. It's not enough to not steal your neighbor's spouse if on the inside you're consumed with the desire to take them as your own. Jesus says it's not enough to just not commit adultery if deep down inside you kind of wish you could. Because if that's the case, Jesus says, your hands may be doing what's right, staying away, but your heart, 
Your heart's polluted and your heart's condition is what really counts. Jesus says it's not enough to love your enemy and hate, I'm sorry, love your neighbor and hate your enemy because God cares about your enemy. God loves your enemy. God blesses your enemy. And so if hate for your enemy is consuming your heart, even if you never express it, even if you never act on it, even if you never go attack, you never use your influence, you never do anything that you could do to hurt that person, even if you never act on that hatred, Jesus says it's not enough. It's not enough to settle for just hating your enemy because if your heart is consumed with hate, then your heart is polluted and the condition of your heart is what really counts. And so Jesus' message, Jesus' ministry, Jesus' vision for the good life is all about heart righteousness rather than rule righteousness. When Jesus shares his worldview and his vision for the good life and his understanding about what a good human life looks like, he talks about purity of heart. And when he talks about purity of heart, he's talking about a heart that's unpolluted. He's talking about a heart that's the same through and through, a heart of integrity. It's like when we talk about pure water, right? When we talk about pure drinking water, what are we talking about? We're talking about water that doesn't have any contaminants in it, water that doesn't have any germs, water that doesn't have any dirt, right? That we all know that that's what pure water, that's what that means. Or when you talk about pure gold, what are you talking about? You're talking about gold that doesn't have any other metals mixed into it, right? There's no other minerals in that. You're talking about gold that is strictly and totally 100% gold. And this is what Jesus means when he says pure in heart. Jesus says being pure in heart means your heart is unpolluted. It's consistent. It's through and through. It's the same. Your heart isn't split down the middle. It's not partially divided being partially devoted to God's will and partially devoted to your own will. It's not being pulled in separate directions like at the middle of a tug of war. Your heart is committed to one purpose and one purpose only. There's one 19th century Christian philosopher who described it this way. He said, purity of heart is to will just one thing, to desire one thing to want God's will, to want God's kingdom, to seek God more than anything else. And the predicament that we find ourselves in, the problem that faces us, is that apart from Jesus, there's never been a human who lived with a pure and undivided heart. It's never happened. When Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, he's talking about nobody. There's nobody that fits that description. Nobody that lives up to that standard. Nobody that possesses that kind of single focused devotion. I'm not surprising you with anything. You knew that already. Every, every minute we've been sitting here talking about what it means to be pure in heart, you've been thinking, oh boy, that sounds like a big hurdle to cross. That sounds impossible. You already know all too well that every single one of us has the capacity to live a double life. Every single one of us has the capacity to be one thing on the outside and another thing on the inside. Every single one of us has the capacity to appear very spotless and clean on the outside and on the inside. There's still a lot of impurity. We know how to appear innocent and pure when it suits us. We know how to put on the right facade. We know how to practice the right rituals so that we look upright to anyone who's looking. But the truth that's hidden from everybody else, the truth that only I and God can see, the truth that only you and God know about yourself is that your heart and my heart need more purifying, right? It's like our hearts are geared for the wrong race. Like our hearts are geared for a race that is all about self-promotion and achievement and striving and grasping and grabbing and holding on to control and power. Our hearts are geared for that race, right? 
and yet we're finding out that the race that we're riding in doesn't call for that kind of gear. The race that we're riding in has a completely different goal. And so here we are, we're stuck. We're stuck. In fact, you know, it struck me as I was studying and preparing this message and I was rereading through all of the list of Jesus' blessings here in this opening section of the sermon, these beatitudes, it struck me that this one blessing, this one beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, is the only condition on this list that we can't achieve on our own. Nobody has to show you how to be sad, right? Nobody has to teach you how to mourn. Nobody has to teach you how to feel powerless. Nobody has to teach you how to feel like you're not sure how things are going to work out. Nobody has to teach you all of that. Nobody has to teach you to wish things were a whole lot better. All of these other blessings that we've read on this list, these are conditions that people find themselves in. Poor in spirit, meek, hungering for righteousness, mourning. These are conditions that people can, can either find themselves in or they can choose for themselves. It happens. But here's pure in heart. This is the one thing none of us can do. This is the one thing none of us can achieve. We can't make ourselves, we can't will ourselves to be pure in heart. When Jesus talks about being poor in spirit or grieving or meekness, we recognize those feelings. We know what that's like. But when he talks about being pure in heart, this is a foreign concept. There's nobody in this room who would be able to tell you, well, I've got a pretty pure heart. I can tell you all about it. And nobody, nobody has that. King David, one of the most devout followers of God. God called him a man after his own heart. And if you know the story of King David, you know about the great victories and the great failures. You know about the moments of devotion and you know about the moments of disappointment. You know that David, somebody that God esteemed as someone who was trying, someone who was on the right track, even David couldn't get there. And he prayed time and time again, God, would you give me a pure heart? Psalm 51, he said, create in me a pure heart. Oh God, would you do it? Would you do the work? Psalm 86, he says, God, give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. This is David begging and saying, I've done all the ritual. I've done all the practice and I've used all my willpower and God, I can't build my own pure heart. David had come to realize that try as he might, to pursue God's will, his human heart was always being pulled in different directions. He knew he couldn't do it on his own. But the amazing news is that in Jesus Christ, God has answered David's prayer. And not just for David, he's answered it for you. God has answered David's prayer about the gift of a pure, clean, undivided heart. Way back in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, God prophesied this in advance, prophesied a plan to restore his people in spite of their sinfulness, in spite of their wicked past. And God said, I will give them an undivided heart. Ezekiel 11, I will give them an undivided heart and I will put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and I will give them a heart of flesh. He says, I'll I'll remove what's dead and I'll put life in there. And then we get to the New Testament. Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. And you wonder, Jesus, who are you talking to? Jesus, who meets that criteria? And Jesus, who fits that description? Pure in heart. Not me. Not you. But then there's 1 John. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. And one of Jesus' closest friends, 
maybe the person who knew Jesus the best as an adult, the Apostle John, Disciple John, he wrote this down for you. He said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. John says, I, I, none of us can do it on our own. We can't do it by ourselves, but help is available. Help is here. So Friday night, I got a text message from one of my friends here in our church, Karen. And she said, my nephew, who's been waiting for a heart transplant, has, been, has gotten the call. And he's going into surgery tonight at midnight. And we texted about how, what a, what a heartbreaking situation that is because you know that somebody else passed away to make that heart available. And we talked about some of that challenge. But the idea that a person could go in with a heart that's not suited for the rest of their life, not suited for the race that's ahead of them and come out of that procedure with a new one. Come out of that procedure with a heart that's gonna work, a heart that's gonna allow them to keep moving in the direction that they're supposed to go. It's just, it's just incredible. But it's not quite as incredible as the heart transplant that we're talking about here. The heart transplant possibility that we're discussing here. Because the truth is that God wants to give you a new heart. God wants to begin the process of renovating your heart, completely changing your heart and gearing your heart for the kind of life you were designed to live. It's not a life that fights for your own way. It's not a life that tries to conquer your enemies. It's not a life that takes whatever you want. It's not a life that just lives for you and your desire. That's the kind of life that you're geared for already, but it's not the kind of life that you can win. And Jesus is saying, you wanna win? You wanna have the good life that you were designed to live? You gotta be retooled, you've gotta be re-geared, you've gotta have a heart transplant and have the kind of heart that cares about justice. Not just for you, but for the people you don't know for the people you don't like. You gotta have a heart transplant to, have, to give you the kind of heart that cares about benevolence, that cares about generosity and hospitality for people that in your estimation don't deserve it. You gotta develop in you with God's help, with God's intervention, the kind of heart that doesn't want to have enemies, wants to turn enemies into friends because you know your enemies are people that God loves too. And so you got to have a brand new heart. And if I was to rephrase this beatitude, not that Jesus needs it rephrasing, but for our better understanding with all of the cultural and historical gap between us and the time when Jesus said it, I'd say it like this, blessed are those who invite Jesus to give them a pure heart. Blessed are those who receive a spiritual heart transplant from God so that they can run the race that they were called to run. And where's that leave you? Where do you stand? What's the condition of your spiritual heart? You know, we've talked about over and over throughout this message that there are no, there's none of us in here that can say we've arrived there. There's none of us in here that can say my heart is pure. But there's a lot of us in here that can say I'm on the journey toward the heart that God wants me to have. 
God is renovating my heart. God is reworking and retooling my heart. God is changing me from the inside out. And the question I've got to ask you is, where are you on that journey? And have you started yet? Is it time to restart? Is it time to reconnect? Because that's the surgery that you need. That's the spiritual procedure that you need to live the good life and you can't do it on your own. So I wanna invite you this morning. We can be ready to help you start that journey together. In the spiritual sense, you lay yourself down just like somebody on an operating table. You lay yourself down into these waters of baptism and you come back out of that water with Jesus beginning the process of renovating your heart. For some of you, that needs to be the first step. It needs to be the next step. It needs to be the now step. And if you've already taken that step, then maybe today's reminder for you is that this process isn't over. And this process only makes progress when you allow Jesus access to all the parts of you to all the parts of your previously impure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, Jesus says, for they will see God. You look elsewhere in scripture and you'll see passages that say nobody can look at God. Nobody can see God. Nobody can gl glimpse the face of God and survive that. Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. I just have to imagine, I just have to imagine that when we're chasing God with an undivided heart, with, when we're chasing God with a singular focus and a singular desire, we're gonna look around us and we're gonna see the fingerprints, the impact, the influence of God everywhere we look, starting in the mirror, we're gonna see what God's doing and we're gonna be amazed.